Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, the discussion actually provided the perfect segue, I think, for the next talk. And uh, very pleased to introduce Randy Ray with a talk on the value of money. Um, in, in our conversation, we, you know, we often do this as a heuristic device, you know, uh, when we try to distinguish financial constraints from real constraints, it's a very useful way to approach things. But when we think about money, in fact, the financial side can't really be separated from the real side, because just the way money is born is always related to some sort of either production process or some sort of extraction process. MMT emphasizes the tax-driven nature of how money appears, and that is ultimately directly linked to the real resource side. So as I was thinking how to introduce this talk, um, I uh, it occurred to me that actually Randy's talk has really important implications for a kind of a fundamental paradox in a monetary economy. Um, and the paradox is this, that unemployment is indeed always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And yet providing more money and more spending into the system does not guarantee its elimination. And this idea that money is, or that unemployment is a monetary phenomenon certainly is not new. I'm very glad to see Kai's slide there on Marx. You know, Marx famously explained to us that in a monetary production economy, uh, the profit-seeking process and surplus extraction guarantees the existence of unemployment. Uh, Veblen, right, talked to us uh, how the uh, system uh, values pecuniary motives, financial motives over instrumental motives, and that actually uh, prevents the extension or offer of employment, even if technologically we can do it and productivity allows it. And of course, we know Keynes. Uh, you know, Keynes's theory of effective demand liquidity preference theory is very important for understanding the process of financing of investment and how there is always an alternative, a financial alternative for investments that is not employment generating. And thus you can see unemployment even at the peak of the economic cycle because liquidity preference, the community as a whole doesn't line up um, um, uh, with, with full employment. And MMT complements these traditions. MMT adds a new dimension. It highlights taxation as a neglected cause of unemployment. Um, we, you know, we're well known for saying taxes drive money, and we basically emphasize how in a monetary system, this, this framework of compulsory fine fees, taxes, obligations that everyone must, must meet uh, also compels us to earn that which settles the tax. And the inability to do so creates a, a kind of unemployment. And so the tax system itself is a monetary cause, neglected monetary cause of of the existence of unemployment. So I think all these uh, explanations uh, complement each other, but I think they also offer substantive theoretical reasons why um, uh, the volume of spending is essential, but it is not enough to guarantee full employment and why the direction and manner of spending uh, very much matter. And so the question of how we spend, the impact of spending also depends on our understanding of the production process, our theory of production, our theory of, um, of value, and quite literally our understanding of, of, of the value of money as well, which is the, uh, the subject of this talk. Uh, Randy Ray himself needs very little introduction, uh, a long time senior scholar at the Levy Economics Institute. He's known as perhaps the most prolific author and developer of the modern money approach. Um, he has written extensively on the public nature of money, but what uh, uh, makes his scholarship particularly valuable is that he has made equally significant contributions to other uh, heterodox traditions, including the post-Keynesian theory with his work on endogenous um, uh, money, as well as American institutionalism with his work on financial instability and the institutional development of money manager capitalism. I'm really uh, delighted that he agreed to do this talk but because this talk actually weaves in contributions from various theoretical traditions, um, uh, from different intellectual traditions into a story about the value of money. So please join me in welcoming Randy. Well, thanks for the introduction. 
And I think it was only four or five days ago that I decided that I was going to talk about this. Um, Pavlina wanted to push the boundaries of MMT, and so um, I think I'm trying to do that. And actually, there should be a question mark at the end here. Uh, I'm not sure what the implications for MMT are. Originally, I was going to talk about inflation, um, but um, I have switched here. And at the very end, if there is time, I will talk a little bit about implications for our understanding of inflation. Okay, so as Pavlin said, MMT is well known for claiming that taxes drive money uh, from inception, obligations to the authority, create a demand for currency, but that leaves open the value of money. What is it worth? MMT's answer from the very beginning has been money's value is determined by what you have to do to get hold of the currency. So obviously it's related to labor effort. Question is, is that similar to the labor theory of value? In simple models from the beginning, Paulina wrote one of the first papers on that, and um, a uh, WKC graduate, Sam Levy, has written a more recent paper. Um, and uh, MMT, um, uh, it seems like, uh, tends to argue that government can control wages through the job guarantee program, or more generally can control prices by setting the price that the government is willing to pay. Many of you have heard individuals make this claim. As a monopoly supplier of money, government names its price. The question is, can it actually do that in a capitalist system? We need to dig deeper into the nature of capitalism, the relation between prices and value, and determination of each of those. So I'm going to use a synthesis of various strands of heterodox economics to see if we can get pointed in the right direction. I actually started this project way before MMT, 33 years ago. I wrote a paper. I sent it to the Cambridge Journal, 1992. It was hated by everyone, <laughs> post-Keynesians, Sraffians, and Marxists. I put it away. And about a year and a half ago, I started working on it again. Now, you know, with uh, an MMT lens that I didn't have before. But uh, I have found those strands in heterodox economics. So first, I'm sure everyone here is aware that money uh, long predates capitalism and almost certainly predates markets. So we need to explain the existence of money long before there were markets. And I, I could go through the, the uh, historical record and the development of uh, writing, which is very closely related to the origins of money because writing was invented to keep track of money. Um, so anyway, it originated as a unit of account uh, Keynes said that the kind of monetary system that we have today has existed for the past 4,000 years at least. Uh, Graeber's great book uh, talks about uh, the history of debt for the past 5,000 years. So let's say that uh, the kind of money that we have today has existed for 6,000 years at least. And what I mean is that it is uh, the authorities, the state that um, uh, chooses that money of account. And then debts are denominated in that, but transferability of money denominated debts develops much later. Tribute, fines, fees, ties, eventually taxes would be imposed by authorities, settled in the authorities' own debts. Records of the authorities' debts then could be used in private debt settlement. None of that requires markets, um, and it almost certainly predates them. Uh, David Levine, uh, my colleague when I was at Denver, wrote a very nice paper in which he argued that it would it, it makes no sense to argue that we had barter-based uh, markets because specialization to produce something for market would be far too risky in a world without prices and money. So markets likely developed in long-distance trade. This is also what Michael Hudson argues not locally, in a money of account with negotiated prices. And uh, many of those debts were settled in commodities at official prices, not using a medium of exchange. So the logic is 
First, we have social debts, such as Vergeld. Um, then we have debts denominated in money of account. Then we have prices in a money of account. Then we have uh, transferable uh, nominal debts. Keynes said money things. We could say money records. And then finally, markets. So I've just covered about 6,000 years here uh, very quickly. <laughs> Let's move on to value. So what is value? Outside economics, value is closely connected to normative concepts. And of course, uh, economics in the beginning was moral philosophy and very clearly uh, connected to value with the belief uh, that uh, the, the market is going to give us a just or a fair price. Classical economics adopted the labor theory of value from Smith to Marx. Neoclassical economics rises in the 1870s uh, as a counter to Marx's economics. It rejects a normative approach. It substitutes individualistic, subjective, utility theory of value. Relative prices clear markets. They reflect scarcity. And money determines only the nominal things, the nominal price. Uh, price is value in their uh, approach, uh, or at least it's a measure of the value. What about heterodoxy? Uh, many avoid the discussion. They reject both utility theory of value and the labor theory of value. Uh, but Marxists have adopted the labor theory of value. Institutionalists adopt instrumental value theory. Fundamentalist Keynesians adopt the liquidity preference theory of value. Strathians adopt the standard commodity. So this is sort of Jeffrey Harcourt's horses for courses. Uh, I don't think that we have to settle on a single theory of value. And what I'll argue is that we really uh, need at least two. Um, many post-Keynesians adopt a markup approach to pricing. Some adopt a class conflict approach to price and distribution, but without a labor theory of value. So the question is, is value theory necessary? And if so, is there a resolution? So uh, Heil Broner, I, I think, uh, has a very interesting position on all this. The general problematic of value as I see it is the effort to tie the surface phenomena of uh, economic life to some inner structure or order. And I think that this uh, uh, sort of view you can find across uh, the various heterodox approaches. It necessarily looks beyond appearances for essences. Economics now becomes an inquiry into the systemic properties, the structural attributes, the tendencies, and sometimes even the talos of the provisioning process. David Graeber wrote a very nice short book on uh, value theory. And in that book, he argued uh, that the, the purpose of the theory of value is to understand the workings of any system of exchange, including free market capitalism, as part of larger systems of meaning containing conceptions of what the cosmos is ultimately about and what it is worth pursuing in it. Kyle Broner again, Value theory is therefore indispensable for understanding how the capital system, largely guided by price stimuli, uh, tends to toward some kind of determinate outcome. But I like it off low the best. Suppose that a universal amnesia were to wipe out the knowledge of all the present prices, would there be a rule for reestablishing them? If we wake up tomorrow, could we reproduce the price system? So our theory of value informs our beliefs about how this, the deep structure of the capitalist economic system creates a system of prices. And what we're trying to do is see if we can find an alternative to the Balrossian uh, auctioneer of general equilibrium. Taxes drive money, but what determines money's value? Value is commonly attributed to labor effort. Uh, Warren Moser tells the story, he wants his kids to wash his car and he offers his business cards uh, for um, washing the car. They say, why on earth would we want those things? And he says, well, because uh, you're going to have to pay a tax later in order to watch TV and eat dinner. So that gives value to those business cards. Um, uh, Graeber again, Mercantilis located wealth in precious metals. Physiocrats argued all social wealth is derived from agriculture. 
But Adam Smith drew on the moral tradition that argued instead that intrinsic value had to be based in its cost of production, which made labor the main source of value. Um, value is separate from price. However, the invisible hand guided by divine providence would push the market price towards the natural price, which in turn meant that people would indeed be justly rewarded for their labors. Marx took that up, arguing that the capitalist wage system turns human creativity itself into an abstraction that can be bought or sold, necessarily involving alienation, exploitation, and the destruction of what makes life meaningful or worthwhile labor power. Um, so the labor theory of value, Ricardo's version of commodities value determined by the labor required for production. Uh, the problem is he ignored capital. So for Marx, labor power produces surplus labor and exploitation appropriates it. Keynes, you remember when he sets out uh, the, uh, the units of measurement and the way that he uh, is going to treat expectations, uh, he says he's going to adopt two fundamental units of quantity, quantities of money value and quantities of employment, and only two measuring units, the wage unit and the quantity of labor hours. This is the only way to get around the problem of measuring the volume of heterogeneous output and the general level of prices. And so it's not surprising that Keynes reaches the same conclusion that the classical economists had reached. There is no alternative to this. Um, so using ordinary labor as our unit and waiting an hour's employment of special labor in proportion to its remuneration to make labor time a homogeneous measure. Same as Marx. Uh, Kahn said that in the general theory, the money wage is the fulcrum on which rests the whole structure of everything expressed in terms of money. All prices, incomes of every kind, and all money values. A higher level of money wages means that everything expressed in terms of money is higher in the same proportion. So this is Kahn uh, talking about Keynes' general theory. There have been two Marxian approaches to the value of money and a debate that goes back more than 100 years. Um, did Marx really have a commodity money a approach where the value of money is determined by the number of labor hours required to dig the gold out of the ground? Um, just like any other commodity. Uh, I have never thought that this was, uh, that this could possibly have been uh, Marx's intention is not consistent with the other arguments. And in any case, it's irrelevant today. And at almost any time it, uh, during the, that past 6,000 years in which money um, has existed, uh, because what we've had is what people call a fiat uh, money. I don't use that term because I do. There has to be something behind the fiat. Like, you can't just announce uh, the value of money. The uh, other approach I think is consistent with uh, Marx. The value of money is determined at the aggregate level by socially necessary labor time. Money is a pure measure of abstract value. And this was a conceptual leap uh, of humans to uh, come up with the notion that you can measure things that have nothing obvious in common in terms of an abstract measure of value. It's the only pure form that we can measure. Money values, not labor values, drive the production decisions. Money is the only measure of success. At the aggregate level, money value exactly measures the aggregate of labor value. Uh, prices at the micro level have to deviate from labor value. This is why the commodity money story cannot be correct. Um, because we have to redistribute surplus value toward more capital intensive processes, <clears throat> among other factors. Okay, that's the one that Marx and uh, Engels focus on, but there are other factors too. There's a tendency to equalize the money profit rates on capital and the rate of exploitation of labor. So uh, Foley in recent years has been arguing that we need both of these 
it's not just a, a tendency toward a uniform rate of um, exportation. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, prop rates, it's also toward a uniform rate of exploitation of labor, um, which is unpaid labor hours, the ratio of money value to the surplus, <laughs> money value of the surplus to the money wage, given that capital and labor are mobile. Implications for the value of money. The value of money is not the inverse of the aggregate price level. Price indices are arbitrary. Uh, because output is heterogeneous, and we can't simply add that up. Each change in the composition of output changes the price index. So uh, Srapa and Keynes were looking at price indices, and whatever price index we choose, it's arbitrary. It's an arbitrary choice. And any time the composition of output changes, that will change the, um, uh, the price index. We use only two measures of value, labor hours and money wage unit. The value of money equals the amount of labor, time it can purchase at the aggregate level, not at the level of production of individual commodities. The money value of output as a whole is equal to total labor hours multiplied by the money wage unit. Again, that is weighted by the, um, the skills and training and so on of the, the uh, labor force. Minsky argued the price of output is complexly determined and must be higher relative to wages paid to produce uh, it in order to cover uh, finance and other overhead costs. So not only do we have to cover the wage bill, but we have to cover the other costs. that include advertising, management, taxes, and Minsky said, uh, associated with a version of capitalism in which the output is produced. And that version of capitalism can change over time so that the, uh, uh, these other costs uh, can go up or down. At the aggregate, the surplus depends on the share of investment, government spending, and net exports in total output. This comes from the Koleski equation. Gross uh, capital income, that is gross profits, must be redistributed through the price system toward firms with higher business costs, higher capital ratios, and more financial debt. So this is the Minskyan angle um, that is very similar to uh, Keynes and Marx, but adding in the finance. Uh, Foley again, all value is created in production and conserved in the sphere of circulation. This was Marx's claim. However, at the individual firm level, money revenue deviates from the labor value uh, equivalent as surplus values redistributed where one party gives up more value than it receives in uh, money value added with the losers exactly matched by the winners. So in the sphere of um, uh, distribution, uh, uh, that is where we reallocate the surplus value. The value of money, uh, the labor theory of value is the claim that the money value of the whole mass of net production of commodities expresses the expenditure of the total social labor in a commodity producing economy. So a unit of money can be thought of as a claim to a certain amount of abstract social labor expended in the economy. Any particular commodity can be seen as embodying a certain fraction of the total abstract social labor expended in, pr in production it also exchanges for a certain amount of money. So there's a value and there is a price, uh, which represents a possibly different fraction of the abstract social labor expended because it's got to be redistributed according to the uh, capital intensity. So like Keynes, fully adjust measured labor time to correct for differences in the intensity of the work, the skill of the workers and the relation of the technique of production to the current social standard. That is, he uses simple abstract socially necessary. The value of money is then defined as the ratio of aggregate labor time to aggregate money value added. And that is uh, how much labor effort can be purchased with a unit of money. Okay, that's the labor theory of value. We need another, at least one more theory of value. Uh, because we have assets, and assets don't necessarily uh, require any uh, labor in their production. 
Haynes's uh, chapter 17 is a general theory of asset pricing. That's what liquidity preference theory is. This is the essential chapter of the general theory, and it's the chapter almost nobody reads because it's too um, difficult. Um, it's essential to Keynes's theory of effective demand. Money's total return, mostly due to liquidity, is the rooster that sets the standard for all other assets. So we've got Q minus C plus L with money uh, having special characteristics that uh, lead it to act as the rooster that sets the standard. Um, and the terms on which access to external finance is available affects the level of investment. Instead of determining prices after production has taken place, as it does in all the orthodox approaches, most notably the quantity theory of money, um, it uh, money job. Keynes says money does its job earlier in the sequence in the investment decision. That's where money plays its most important role in deciding what kind of asset to hold, not in the pricing of final output. Investment in turn determines effective demand and the wage bill. What will be the total uh, amount of employment in the economy? Hence the aggregate of profit, because investment in simple model uh, determines total profits. Um, and that is surplus value in money terms, available to be redistributed among the capital, which is simply dead labor. Again, money's value is linked to labor hours, not the price. Money does its work earlier before prices are formed. So we need both the liquidity preference and the labor theories of value to analyze a monetary production economy. Labor theory value uh, it alone is not enough. It's not going to tell us what the point of effective demand is and the total amount of employment uh, that will um, exist in the economy. So the labor, uh, sorry, the liquidity preference theory of value gives us a theory of investment and therefore a theory of effective demand. Well, the um, labor theory of value gives us the uh, an explanation of what determines the proper rates and the rate of exploitation. Okay, putting value back into economics. Um, as I said, it started as moral philosophy. It was a normative science. Neoclassical theory claims to be value free. There's no standard of justice outside the market itself. Within capitalist economies, the word value is normally invoked to refer to all those domains of human action that are not governed by the laws of the market. So in other words, all the things that economists don't care about, okay, value matters, but not in economics. So we hear about family values, spiritual values, values in the domains of art and political ideals. In other words, value begins precisely where economic value ends. Marx did not propose a labor theory of value mainly as a way to explain price fluctuations, but as a way of connecting economic theory with broader moral and philosophical concerns. Capitalism turns labor into a commodity, and what an employer buys is an abstraction, that labor's capacity to work, what makes this possible is the specific symbol medium of value, money. And let me say, so the, the, the focus of exploitation has always been on labor, but capitalism uh, exploits land, water, air, women, families, uh, indigenous peoples, Africans brought to America. Capitalism began uh, on the slave plantations in the New World. It is a system of exploitation that goes way beyond just exploiting labor. Um, Skidelsky, what was um, uh, Keynes really uh, all about? He doesn't take wants as given, but rather strives to make our wants desirable wants. He believed that to make the world ethically better was the only justifiable purpose of economic striving. 
And so how can you talk about things like this without that values entering? You saw that capitalism is a necessary stage to get societies from poverty to abundance, after which its usefulness would disappear. Good is objective, and Keynes believed that uh, we know what is good, and that which is to be maximized is not happiness or pleasure, but goodness. The love of money is a neurosis to be tolerated until we achieve the abundance that would allow us to realize the economic possibilities of our grandchildren. So uh, we need to bring uh, value back into economics. And uh, I think at this point, uh, we also could talk about instrumental value theory of the institutionalists and uh, possibly other theories of value. So summing up, uh, we should not equate price and value. Prices serve a variety of functions, including covering costs and allocating uh, money profits. Minsky talks about uh, the purpose of the price system is to validate investment. And so he has this very complex understanding of time. Uh, we inherit uh, a capital stock that results from investments in the past. Those investments in the past were undertaken with a view as to where the economy was going. And they were partially financed with external finance. And so our, the validation of the capital equipment we already have that occurs today depends on our expectations about the future. So whether those decisions we made in the past are made good depends on how we today view the future because if we don't invest now, there will be no profits at the aggregate level now, okay? So it is a, a very um, complex, and this is why uh, the uh, labor theory value alone only gets us part of the way there. We have to have the liquidity preference theory of the determination of investment uh, because we can't validate the current capital stock without having a, a preference for liquidity that is consistent with investment occurring today. Value theory allows us to better understand the underlying economic forces of the capitalist economy, which is a monetary production economy, as Paul Lehman was saying. Even so, and while profits accrue in uh, money terms, money does not determine price. It does its work earlier, as I said, um, determining where the labor effort will be directed. Uh, and later in determining the success of production, so realizing value, which comes back to, to Minsky's uh, question about whether the investments can be validated. Value is determined in production, not in circulation. While money circulates output and redistributes the surplus, it doesn't determine the value, which is only maintained in circulation. Micro-level competitive advantage, pricing power, and markups uh, over costs do not affect aggregate profits or the value of money. You can do a mental experiment. What if investment is zero this year? Well, then in the simple model, profits are zero. And it doesn't matter how competitive the firms are and how much uh, they spend on marketing. All that the uh, price system can do is redistribute value. There's a winner and a loser. It can't create any uh, profits at the end. Um, micro so micro-level competition doesn't explain the, the source of profits. It does affect the distribution of surplus value. Money wages and prices are not ar arbitrary, so we sort of have an answer. Uh, to the question, or if we wake up tomorrow, can we reproduce this system? They gravitate to levels to equalize proper rates and the rate of exploitation. But I want to emphasize that it, this is a tendency. We will never get there. We will never get there because there is true uncertainty in the world. And it's unlikely that our expectations are going to be realized. So looking back, we can say we will always have regrets over the choices that we made. And uh, we're not going to get there, but there's a tendency to push us that way. In the same sense that Keynes argued that uh, there's a tendency 
for all of the marginal efficiencies to come down to the, uh, the uh, return to holding money. It's a tendency we will never get. Okay, and I I don't. Do I have time? Okay. So just um, uh, to to move on to what can we possibly say about inflation? Um, MMT from the very beginning has emphasized that real resources limit our spending and spending more than. Uh, our uh, real capacity to produce uh, can be inflationary. We need to resource spending rather than finance it. And uh, so as Stephanie uh, Kelton was uh, arguing, instead of doing the, uh, uh, looking at the, the possible impacts uh, on the deficit of a government spending program, we should be looking at how we can resource that. Um, or a Green New Deal or Building Back Better or whatever. Uh, we take a functional approach to taxation. So taxes can be used to withdraw demand to prevent inflation if you do undertake some big project like a Green New Deal. But not all taxes are created equal in terms of with, um, releasing resources. We need to anchor the currency a job guarantee uh, program will help to regulate wages. It uh, sets a floor so that wages cannot go below the floor, but it also uh, acts as a buffer stock to help reduce inflation pressures. As the economy heats up, workers can be recruited out of the program. So it helps to regulate the money price of an hour of labor. Um, what is inflation? It's a reduction of the purchasing power of money. Uh, that is the wage in terms of abstract labor expended. It's not an increase of some arbitrary price index. Um, remember, Keynes argued that uh, you cannot have inflation until full employment, until you've exceeded full employment. Uh, when you've exceeded the capacity to produce and uh, you can't increase output anymore, anywhere in the economy, then you have reached the point of true inflation. Anything before that is semi-inflation. And he argued that um, trying to fight semi-inflation by increasing unemployment is only something some fool would do, okay? Uh, and then the, the problems are made worse <clears throat> because our measures of inflation are indexes, they're human creations. There's nothing natural about them at all. And the, the CPI in particular is extremely flawed as a uh, measure of the value of money. It uh, is including things that are imputed, 40% of the uh, uh, our recent inflation is uh, strictly because of this index that we're using. Um, when the... Um, uh, COVID relief uh, uh, was uh, proposed. Um, this was claimed to be an MMT policy, uh, just printing up money to pay for spending. And the mainstream belief is that inflation is almost always a demand side problem. That slow growth is a supply side problem. So before the, uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, we had people like Larry Summers and Paul Krugman arguing that we were in danger of um, secular stagnation. And the problem was on the supply side, which was the claim of uh, Robert Gordon's uh, otherwise very good book. Uh, then uh, when the COVID relief, uh, uh, five trillion was uh, put into the economy, uh, that caused a demand side problem with inflation. The reality is that uh, price index inflation, uh, not true inflation, is a supply side problem most of the time. And in the United States case, I would say it has always been the problem. Since World War II, we've never had a demand side problem. We have chronically insufficient aggregate demand during uh, 50 years and more neoliberalism. 
with depressed domestic investment. Well, low investment uh, reduces the surplus that's being generated. And that um, in order to uh, preserve monetary uh, profits, what has happened is the labor share has uh, declined uh, as a, a percent of um, total income. And uh, the rise of business st style expenses, that's Minsky's terminology, has greatly increased finance share of total income. We came to rely on imports and supply chains. Uh, net imports, as Minsky argues, reduce the size of the surplus uh, and also reduce price pressure. So that's part of the explanation for the low measured uh, rise of price indices over the past 30 years. But then supply, uh, the supply side collapsed, uh, COVID led to the deepest recession. We had a lot of idiosyncratic price increases, which again reveals something about the index. Uh, you couldn't buy new cars, so we were buying used cars. And so used car prices went up a lot. And so the measured inflation rate is driven up by this very idiosyncratic thing not even something newly produced is driving up the CPI. And so we need to try to fight that uh, with tight monetary policy. Okay, so the COVID response um, I probably, I, well, definitely played a big role in helping us to get out of the, the trough of that extremely deep recession, um, but the spending was not well targeted. So it was nothing like what uh, MMT would recommend. Uh, the source of our current inflation, uh, well, current uh, eight months ago, it, it looks like we may well uh, be moving out of that, was oil, food, and shelter, as it always is. Dimitri and I, since 1994, have been writing on um, the CPI and the measures of inflation. And um, all three of our high inflation periods in the post-war period have always been driven by oil, food, and shelter. Well, really, there's only two components because food is oil. 70% of the cost of food is oil. Um, so oil and shelter are what drive it, and shelter is mostly imputed. It has nothing to do with market forces. Um, in addition, this time around, we've had price gouging, uh, rising markups. There still is no evidence of a wage price spiral. Patience was the best policy. Raising rates doesn't help. We have a severe housing shortage in the United States. Raising uh, uh, interest rates, uh, it, it took a while, but it is, ha is having a big impact now on construction of new uh, housing in the United States. Um, spending generally isn't interest sensitive. Consumers don't or at least shouldn't have to borrow to finance fuel, food, and so on. The things that actually go into the CPI rising. Um, and then we have also got cost uh, feed through effects as um, interest costs go up. If you ask a uh, hundred economists, uh, if wages go up, what's going to happen to inflation? If you ask them, if um, oil prices go up, what's going to happen to inflation? Go up. Ask them, well, if interest rates go up, what's going to happen to inflation? It goes down. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, interest is a, a very significant business cost. And for some reason, uh, business firms don't increase their price when uh, interest rates go up. Um, and then finally, uh, the interest income from government bonds, Warren Moser has been pushing this idea that uh, this could be stimulative. And we have, uh, right now we're spending about 800 billion a year on interest on government bonds. That's uh, up by 200 billion over last fiscal year. Could that possibly uh, lead to additional spending, I'm still very doubtful, uh, but possibly uh, it could uh, prop up spending a bit. Anyway, the answer to supply side inflation is not to reduce demand, but to increase supply. So Biden was right, uh, Build Back Better would be an anti-inflation uh, program. Uh, however, uh, didn't get much of what he wanted and it would take time. Uh, to uh, build the capacity to reduce inflation pressure. I do have data, but I think I'll stop and you know, we'll see it. Okay, thanks. Questions?
Two thoughts for the price of one inflation value. <laughs> so, what do you think is Powell's rationale for now? I mean, what what do you, how do you think he doesn't absorb this information that you do, or this that's very obvious? Yeah. <laughs> so, since um, around 1990. Uh, central bankers have gradually adopted this view that inflation is caused by expected inflation. So if we can get people to not expect inflation, there won't be inflation. All right. And uh, so they believe that, um, I, that they successfully accomplished that uh, in the 1990s. Um, by always talking about inflation and how uh, how determined they were to fight inflation, and then demonstrating how determined they were to fight inflation by raising interest rates even when there was no increase of inflation. Okay, and if you read the transcripts, they they actually the trans transcripts of the FOMC, uh, Greenspan and the other members actually talk this way. So we started getting the transcripts released uh, after 1994. There's a five-year lag, but you can go back and read what they were saying every time when they decided to raise interest rates, okay? And the discussion will go something like this. Well, we don't see any inflation pressure yet, okay? However, uh, there seems to be uh, pressure on wages, and so, and one of them will say, yeah, uh, my brother owns a, uh, he said a restaurant. It actually was McDonald's. <laughs> owns a restaurant. And he's having trouble finding anyone who can uh, pass a drug test uh, to hire. Okay. Or can speak English. Uh, and, oh, there's wage pressure. Okay. I mean, this is the level of the analysis. Uh, and so then, okay, so there's wage pressure. So we better raise rates now to send the signal that we're fighting inflation so people won't expect inflation, so there won't be inflation. Okay, well, we had a very long period of time where inflation was very low. And so it's working. Okay, so the Fed is in the news all the time, uh, vigilant about fighting inflation. Um, and. So it worked until it didn't. Uh, when the global financial crisis hit, our problem was not inflation, it was deflation. Okay, so the, uh, the Fed uh, goes down to zero, so we have zero interest rate policy, has no impact on the economy. Okay, inflation stays at one or 2%. Uh, I, sorry, 1%, they want it to go to two. They can't get it to two. They thought they would send the signal that the Fed wants inflation to rise to two by lowering the interest rate to zero. Didn't work. Okay, what else can they do? Oh, let's do QE. So they do trillions of dollars of QE and all the other big central banks do the same thing. Doesn't have any impact on expectations. Okay, why? Because there's no inflation. If there's no inflation, people don't expect inflation. Okay, but then this time in inflation picks up. And so inflation is supposed to be caused by expected inflation. When inflation picks up, expected inflation did not. Um, now, gradually, expectations converge to reality. If they have to. Um, so gradually, people's expectations have been rising uh, of inflation. So um, the Fed finally is getting what it wanted. <laughs> Uh, it wanted it back then. Now it wants its expectations to go down. Um, the expectations are still well below the what inflation actually hit. Um, so uh, there's some hope the Fed will stop uh, doing this. But that's what it's all about. It's about expectations. Does the Fed really believe that the raising rates has that much impact on spending? I can't believe that they do because there just isn't empirical evidence of it. There's evidence that it has an impact on the housing markets, but outside that, there just isn't much evidence for it. So I don't think that they really believe that raising interest rates works through the um, 
uh, spending channel. It has to work somewhere else. For the scary channel. Hmm? For the confidence yeah. scary channel. Yeah. Um, I, I, I appreciate you know the complication or nuance added to the labor theory of value discussion and how we can do that. I'm just wondering where land fits in for you. I mean, we can sort of you know reduce it down to capital and labor in some ways. But for, for example, if you think about the enclosure movement, right? You don't need a story of taxing labor there to actually create a monetary circle. All you need to do is put a, a wall around important resources that everybody needs to access, and it, it achieves the same function as a proactive obligation imposed. Um, but also thinking about even sort of colonial context, obviously labor is central. You can see it throughout history. It's always a central part of any of these systems. But if you're talking about somebody who's got a tax obligation, and one way to do that is to provide labor, and the other way is to sell resources that you've already have some property claim over or some sovereignty, then it seems to me at least there's some parallel track going on where the value of the dollar could be what I have to give up in labor or what I have to give up in claims that I have over resources that for whatever geopolitical reason we've accepted that I had a legitimate claim on day one. But if I can be forced to sort of transfer them to you over time, it will achieve a similar kind of flow function. And it matters to me only because when I think about the future of the digital economy and things, we've got like data. Right. It could be a world where very few people are working, but we are all generating a lot of data that they get sold to companies and that that is the primary extraction of value that's coming out of us. Um, so I'm just sort of curious for you where you put land in this story, because it seems like it's a classical kind of element in these that was sort of not as prominent in your paradigm. Well, uh, so we've got to have a price on the land. So we need some kind of... Uh, well, we need private property and we need uh, uh, a market in land um, for it to have the money value. And uh, uh, if we're talking about the, a system where we've already got uh, money prices on assets, I would put that in the asset price system. And uh, Keynes does have this comment, which is bizarre. Uh, that, that sometimes in the past, land has been the rooster because land was the most liquid thing. Um, I'm not convinced of this at all. It doesn't have, uh, I mean, it's just not consistent with the way that I think of money and a monetary uh, production economy. Um, but I... Re regarding uh, the colonial systems, uh, I don't. I would have to think about that. But in um, our modern monetary systems, I would include land in in the asset category. Um, I found the the pure theory part of your talk extremely interesting, um, and this kind of you know, attempt to synthesize Foley's uh, version of Marx's value theory and Keynes's liquidity preference theory. Um, a kind of a problem that's in Foley that I didn't quite see fully handled was this problem of the value of money is not just ex post, but also as ex ante, uh, where Foley defines it in a ex post way, definitionally, through that uh, total value added ratio to living labor. Uh, and I saw your turn to liquidity preference theory as a way to have that uh, ex-ante value. Um, but I'm curious that if, if, is there kind of implicitly a commodity standard in the, what you laid out, but, but, but a kind of paradoxical one, um, where specifically labor is a commodity and thus grounds the value of money. Is that kind of an implicit argument you're making by combining Foley's labor theory of value with uh, Keynes' liquidity preference theory. I'm not sure I know exactly what you're getting at. Um, so labor is a commodity, and we have to um, pay the the value of labor power, but um, it can produce more value than required to reproduce that commodity labor okay so what do you mean do you mean something more than that that labor is a commodity 
I'm not quite catching that. I was specifically, so you started off in that slide at the very beginning by um, saying Marx has this kind of weird theory of money that's a commodity standard, but it's not consistent yeah. with the rest of his value theory. Yeah. Uh, I kind of take the, the opposite approach that it actually is consistent, but for highly specific reasons that are not the kind of standard Ricardian way of thinking about it. And But one of those reasons is that in order for M to become M prime, in order for money to become more money, there needs to be a value prior to that final realization that kind of you can have a determinant magnitude that then can become greater. And so that's what I view as the, the, the problem in full, that it can't, he can't quite ground with that because he's defining the value of money ex post. But if we treat the value of labor power, as I kind of saw what you were doing um, by turning to Keynes and the, and the money uh, as a wage unit is one of the only quantities you can truly know. Uh, is, there, is that kind of an implicit commodity standard if we consistently treat labor power as a commodity just like every other commodity in, a, in that kind of definitional It's way. not just like every other commodity. It's unique. But in terms of its value, it is like any other commodity. Well, it's valuable because it has uh, the ability to produce surplus value. So it's different than the others. The, but the, let, let's go back to the MCM prime. So MCM prime is describing the, um, the motivation of capitalists, right? So mm -hmm. I don't, don't see the, the ex ante, ex post, it's a motivation. I'm gonna start with money. I, why do I need the money? Well, I need to hire laborers mm -hmm. and I have to pay the wage. Okay, but I'm only going to do that on the expectation that I will end up with more money at the end of this. Okay. So the uh, the ex ante is I need to get all the money, and the ex post is I need to end up with more money. Yes, and so my argument is that at the opening of the circuit, the value of labor power in the aggregate across the entire capitalist class and the entire working class, that is kind of implicitly the value of money. That you need credit money, but a lot of that is going in transfers between capitalists, between uh, intermediate inputs. That once you aggregate this, that there is some sort of relationship between the, money, the credit money that opens the circuit and the value of labor power. And that this is a kind of strange way of grounding a commodity money. It's not the same as the gold standard or anything like that, but it is kind of linking the value of one commodity to the value of money uh, at the opening and not just the end. Money is not a commodity. Labor. Yeah. Credit money is not a commodity. It's the only kind there is. <laughs> okay. So I, I think that was a mistake in Marx, thinking that because there were gold coins, the value of those gold coins was determined by the embodied commodity, gold, which is a produced commodity. That was a mistake. We've never had that, okay? There, there are times when coins will fall to the commodity uh, value, but they're no longer money. Okay? That, that typically would be when they have, you know, left the the, um, the sovereignty, the, or another country, and there's uh, uh, no reach of the sovereign power to try to collect that back in taxes. So that sets the minimum value of coins because you can melt them down and get the gold. But coins uh, will almost always circulate above that. Um, within the, the nation. So I, I think that that's a mistake to say, well, there was a time when there was a commodity money and then there's a time when it's not. No, uh, th this also was Keynes's point when he says for the past 6,000 years at least, okay, we have not had a commodity money. Uh, see, he said 4,000, I said <laughs> um, uh, what happened before that, it's extremely unlikely that there ever was a commodity. Okay, but we say, uh, I think with a pretty high degree of certainty that um, there has not been a commodity for the past 6,000 
so for normal people, if you're going to try to explain the first part of your talk about the value of money, um, how could you explain it? Is it more complicated than the first NMT kind of description of the value that's determined by what you have to do to get it from the issuer? If you could synthesize the like what you're adding to that, or yeah, for normal people in like a sentence or two, um, <clears throat> and 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 yeah, and why would what that would be in my Okay. Simplest I can say is prices are very complexly determined. Okay. And so to say that the government, because it's the monopoly issuer of the currency, uh, can set all the prices. Mm, no. Because there is an underlying structure of the capitalist economy. Okay. So you are not free to set the price because you're going to violate um, this, uh, both the, the rate of profit and the rate of exploitation, sort of gravitation toward equalizing across production processes. Okay. And in the, in the 1998 book, I, I went through a simple example uh, in which uh, the government tries to do that. And it's sort of a, it's equivalent to the problem of trying to have a silver and a gold standard at the same time. Okay, because you're going to be promoting production of um, the one that has the higher value uh, over the, uh, the other. So same thing would happen. If the government gets the prices wrong, okay, the, the thing that doesn't produce much profit, you're not going to produce that anymore. Everyone's going to go to, to produce a thing that the government has set too high of a price on. Because there's a, you know, a tendency to equalize profit rates, and that that's where the liquidity preference plays a role too. Because it's not just equalizing uh, profit rates on uh, productive uh, capital equipment; it's across the, the full range of anything you can hold through time. In in Keynes, there's a wheat rate of interest. There's a copper rate of interest. It's it's everything. Okay, that you can hold through time. There's a tendency to equalize the expected returns. And that's what would be violated by government trying to settle those prices. So I, I, I think still, you know, the argument that I, the, uh, uh, the government should try to operate a buffer stock policy makes sense. And then you've got to choose the best buffer stock. And obviously that is labor because it goes into producing everything. And because we care about labor, like Bill, Bill Mitchell says, we don't really care if the sheep are fully employed. Uh, so buffer stock of wool doesn't make as much sense as a buffer stock of labor because we want people to have access to jobs in a capitalist economy at least, where it's expected that you are responsible for your own individual welfare. And it's just a really good follow-up. Like, is it still accurate to say, you know, at the starting point, the value is determined by what they're just able to get it from the issue, and then there's the more complex on top of that? Or yeah, from inception, mm -hmm. you could say, from inception, uh, you are trying to build a monetary economy. Then um, what you have to do to get, you know, what that which is necessary to pay your tax is going to drive the demand and, and determine the amount of effort you have to put into getting the currency. That's fine. That does not describe a capitalist economy. Okay. That can describe how you monetize a uh, tribal society, but it can't explain uh, prices in a capitalist economy. Okay, last question because we're hungry. <laughs> uh, very last question. Um, so, you know, as we know from Marx, the term capitalism was developed as a critique of the capitalist system through the definition of a private zone means of production. So, more more recently, scholarship has kind of emphasized varieties of capitalism, the heterogeneity of capitalism, and all of this, of course, implying a before capitalism and potentially an after capitalism. So my question is, where do you, through this kind of analysis that brings Keynes into the conversation, 
delineate what that after capitalism would be, or if that question is even useful. Uh, you know, Minsky says there are 57 varieties of capitalism, and some are clearly better than others. Uh, so he described the, the kind we got at the end of World War II as being practical best. Um, it was pretty good. Uh, we deserve better than that one. And clearly we deserve better than the one we have now. Uh, so uh, I, I think we can uh, work on making this one better. Uh, I really don't know. Uh, so, you know, Keynes had this uh, idea 100 years from now, where we'll be working four hours a week, have all of our needs met. And it's clear that we're capable of doing that. Okay. And the environment would thank us for it <laughs> if we were living that way. Um, but uh, how do you get there? No idea. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>